So as a passionate Turkaboo, and yes, that is the official title, not Turkologist or whatever, I love learning about all the different Turkic languages out there in the world, and there's one that stands out more amongst the rest of them. Why is this, and what makes it a, such a unique language among the Turkic family? To find out, we'll be exploring the Volga region of Russia to learn about the Chuvash people and language, and their rich, interesting history. Before we can analyze this language, we need a little context, so who even are the Chuvash people, and where do they come from? The Chuvash live in the heart of European Russia, with most of the population being found west of the Volga River, however, this is not their original homeland. The modern Chuvash people are thought to be the descendants of the Bulgar and Suar Turkic tribes, with a few other different groups that these tribes met along their history that intermixed and gave us what would be the modern Chuvash people. The name Bulgar might sound familiar to you if you know anything about about Bulgarian history, or you know, if you have ears. That would be because the ancestors of the Chuvash and the Turkic founders of Bulgaria have the same origins and come from the same ancestors. Most of the rest of the population of old Bulgaria found themselves migrating north to the middle Volga region where modern day Chuvashia is and formed the volga bulgar state, which eventually became a vassal of the Khazars. During the Mongol invasion that would come to the region in the 13th century, the tribes of the volga bulgar people would migrate even further up north, coming into contact with indigenous Finnic tribes and assimilating with them. Some of these tribes included Mordvians and Mari peoples. This process of assimilation between these Turkic peoples and Finnic-speaking peoples explains why we see a lot of influence from Finnic languages in the Chuvash language today, so much so that this language was argued amongst linguists in the past, whether it was a a Finnic language uh, undergoing a process of heavy Turkification, or a Turkic language with a heavy process of Finnification, if that is a word. It seems the latter has proved out to be what the consistence is today, as we are talking about it today, as a Turkic language. During this time, the Chuvash region became a vassal of the Golden Horde, which was a successor state to the Mongol Empire, which took power in the region. During the decline of the Golden Horde, the Kazan Cognate took power in the region and absorbed the Chuvashia region. Chuvashia is known for being a part of Russia. So how exactly did Russians and Russia enter the picture and story of Chuvashia? Well, this is how. Most of you have probably heard of Ivan the Terrible, who is a big reason for why Chuvashia today is a part of Russia. Following an invasion into Moscow in 1540 by Safa Garai of the Kazan Cognate, which ended in retreat, the campaign to repress the Kazan Cognate and their attacks into Russia heated up with Safa Garai beginning to lose power due to this embarrassing retreat in his invasion into Moscow. The rise of pro-Russian sentiment would rise in the region following his failed invasion into Moscow, with Ivan the Terrible himself even coming into the region in 1545 to express support for pro-Russian supporters in the region and in the Kazan Cognate, which wanted to see a pro-Russian ruler in the Cognate. In 1552, Ivan the Terrible led an army and attacked the region until it eventually came into the control of the Russian Tsar. The Chuvash crown in particular submitted to and supported the Russian Tsar two months into the invasion as it seemed like Russia was going to take control of the region. So now that we have a little context into the history of Chuvash, let's take a look at how the actual language is and how it works, and we're going to start with with influences in the language. One of my favorite aspects of linguistics is how languages don't exist in a vacuum and influence each other over time and take certain elements of each other. Various languages that have influenced the Chuvash language include proto semitic Mongolian, Proto-Hungarian, Alan, and several Eastern European languages. However, these are much, much older influences that have been a part of the Chuvash language for centuries. Uh, some more recent uh, examples of influences include Tatar, Russian, Persian, and Arabic. These influences are more pronounced in the language. The Volga Bulgarians eventually converted to Islam from Tengrism and other Turkic beliefs, which is why we see a lot of influences from Arabic and Persian, mostly in vocabulary. As previously mentioned, the Turkic-speaking Chuvash people came into extensive contact with Finnic Volga uh, tribes and different speaking peoples in the Volga region which explains the very heavy influence from Volga Finnic uh, languages like Mordvins and Maris that we see in the Chuvash language today. One of the main ways I've found that Russian has influenced the Chuvash language is in pronunciation as well as in different vocabulary, of course. So now we're going to take a look at orthography or writing systems in Chuvash. The Chuvash language today is written in a modified Cyrillic script, showing more of the Russian influence on the language, with the notable exception of Chuvash people living in Europe and America 
America, which tend to use the Latin alphabet more. The Chuvash alphabet was created by Chuvash writer and Chuvash teacher Ivan Yaklovich Yaklev in 1873. The Chuvash language was originally first written in the Orkhon script, which is the script of the Dok Turks, which is the ancestor of all modern Turkic tribes and peoples today. The Arabic script replaced this uh, Orkhan script in Chuvash society after the Volga Bulgar elites converted to Islam and took in a lot of Arabic and Persian influence as previously mentioned as well. Writing in Chuvashia declined after the Mongol invasion and didn't really pick up until the Cyrillic alphabet was created for the Chuvash language after coming into the Russian sphere of influence. Phonology while doing research for this video in Chuvash, I found the phonology of Chuvash to be pretty wild and distinct from other Turkic languages. The sounds and pronunciation of this language are also much, much more similar to Russian than I expected them to be. But not all speakers I found have this sort of heavy Russian influence on pronunciation. It kind of depends, I feel like. There's also quite a few unique letters that aren't found in English that are in the Chuvash language, which always makes for a really interesting language and interesting sound to a English speaker. To start with, Chuvash has eight vowels, with the ninth being found only in Russian loanwords. The eight Chuvash sounds are a closed front rounded, a closed front unrounded, a middle front, an open front unrounded, a closed central unrounded, a closed back rounded, a middle back, and an open back vowel. The ninth sound, which is only used for Russian words, is a mid back rounded vowel and can be seen in words like Soviet and Storos. And please forgive me for all the pronunciation I'm about to do for this video for the Chuvash words. I could not find a Chuvash speaker online readily available to do these, so I'm just going to give it my best shot, but there are also a few consonants in Chuvash that only appear in Russian loan words, like the previously mentioned Storos. Here are all the lone consonants in Chuvash. Overall, Chuvash has 21 consonants, with about 8 of those being reserved only for Russian loanwords, meaning the endogenist consonant inventory of Chuvash is only 13. Pretty small, so less stuff to learn. Yay, let's go. Two of the most interesting of these consonants, at least to me, is the voiced alveolopalatal fricative and the voiceless alveolopalatal affricate. In the case of the voiceless alveolo palliative affricate, God, why do language keep using such long and insane words that I can't pronounce and I'm struggling with? It sounds very similar to the voiceless post alveolar affricate or the ch sound, but it's ever so different. To be honest, I really can't hear the difference between them. And I personally also really love the voiceless alveolo palliative fricative, this guy right here, because it's actually the same sound you hear when British people say, Tuesday. A Tuesday, in it. Here's a table of all the consonant sounds in Chuvash, and I encourage you guys to check it all out if you are a language nerd like me and have absolutely nothing else going on in your life. Vowel harmony. Vowel harmony is a rule found in Chuvash and in other Turkic languages that requires the vowels in a word to only have either front vowels or back vowels in them, and the previous vowel determines what the next vowel type will be. For example, tupe meaning rooftop, and also shisham, meaning lightning. And for back vowels, we have uksya, meaning money, and also pusha, meaning empty or void. Chuvash differs from other Turkic languages with this concept in that it is not as strict of a rule in Chuvash as it is in other Turkic languages. Many loan words in Chuvash and other irregular words in general can be found that break this vowel harmony sometimes. Some suffixes in other Turkic languages adhere to vowel harmony, whereas in Chuvash they don't, like in the Turkish plural suffix, which adheres to vowel harmony, whereas the plural suffix in Chuvash does not change according to what vowel comes previously. In Turkish, we have evler, meaning houses, and dalar meaning mountains. Notice how the plural suffix changes depending on the previous vowel. This doesn't happen in Chuvash, like with kukalsam, meaning pies, and upkesem, meaning lungs. The plural form changes to end in a sen stem when other suffixes are added on after it. Morphology. Like with all Turkic languages, Chuvash is an agglutinative language, meaning you add suffixes to the ends of words to convey a grammatical meaning and change the sense of the meaning and the grammar functionality of the word. This means Chuvash and other Turkic languages are highly morphological, meaning you're going to have to memorize a ton of different word forms in order to learn and speak this language comfortably. The Chuvash language has six core cases, which include nominative, genitive, accusative, locative, ablative, and instrumental. These aren't the only cases in the language, but are considered to be the six main ones. 
The nominative case is the form in which the noun is the main subject of the sentence or is the main subject of the verb receiving the action. For example, the word tapra, meaning ground or soil, is in the nominative case, and in chuvash, the nominative case is just the default dictionary form as well. The genitive suffix in chuvash adds a n sound after a vowel and an on, un, n, or n following a consonant. For example, lassa, meaning horse, and lassun, meaning of the horse, and then for example, with a consonant at the end, we have halach, meaning people, and halachan, meaning of the people. Chuvash also has a sound rule for certain vowels in the genitive case. If the noun stem ends in an u or u, that vowel is changed to an a or a, and the suffix van or ven is added to show possessive. For example, tu becomes tavan, meaning mountain and of the mountain, and pu and peven means growth and of the growth. Or of growth. Words that end in these interesting letters of uh and uh, which I cannot really tell the difference of and I'm definitely pronouncing incorrectly, cause the previous consonant to go through a process of gemination or consonant lengthening, a feature similar to some Finnish declension showing us some more uh, evidence of the influence from Finnic languages on Chuba. For example, pulla and pullun meaning fish and of the fish, and we also have vita and vitan, meaning dog and of the dog. A few Russian loan words end in the consonant ss and the consonants ll, which have a bit different of the way they work in this form. For example, klas, meaning class, becomes klasun, and metal becomes metalun. Huh, I guess English and chuvash do have some words in common. Who would have thought some random Turkic language in Russia would have some similar words with English? The accusative or dative case in chuvash adds a na or a sound to the end of the noun, or it can also add a ne or an e sound, depending on vowel harmony. Now, depending on whether the root form of the noun ends in a consonant or vowel determines whether we use the na or a suffix. For example, paksa becomes paksana, meaning to the squirrel, and ene becomes enene, meaning to the cow. Words that end in a consonant like ui and tir, meaning field and leather, turn into uye and tire. And words that end in the letter i have the suffix ye added to them to show the dative case. For example, we have shushi and shushie, meaning mouse and to the mouse. Like in the genitive case, vowels that end in either of these letters have that vowel removed and these suffixes are added instead. Like in palu, fact, becoming peleve in this case. I guess Chuvash speakers really don't like adding suffixes to words that end in that sound for whatever reason. The locative case has three different forms. These are ra, re, ta, te, che. The ta, te suffix only occurs when the words end in an n, r, or an l. For example, pasar, meaning bazaar or a marketplace, turns into pasarta, and kil, meaning home, turns into kilte, at the home. The cha and ch locative suffix is only used after the plural suffix or if the third person genitive suffix is used, like in alaksen che, meaning in the doors. The ra and ra suffix is used in all other instances and sort of acts like a default of the three. For example, pachchara, meaning in the garden, and sirva, meaning in the water. The ablative case functions in the same way as a locative case, except each suffix has an n attached to it. For example, iltantan, meaning from gold, and turan, meaning from the mountain, and mulsenchan, meaning from the goods. The instrumental case in chuvash adds a pa suffix at the end of nouns. For example, sharpa, meaning with the army or with a army. There are a few exceptions for loan words, like in poyezda, meaning train with poyez coming from Russian, where the da suffix is used instead. Now, being an agglutinative language, Shuvash has many, many more suffixes that can be described as case forms that we're going to go through and look at a few, but the previously mentioned six are considered the core six of Chuvash. These ones are some that I picked out that also are probably pretty useful to know when learning Chuvash. The way to express without in Chuvash is done with the suffix sar and sir. For example, sohasar, sohasar, meaning without beard. The way to express that you are going towards something or going to or add something is with the suffix alla or elle, as in varmanla, as in varmanalla, meaning towards the woods and 
cherele, meaning towards the heart. Interestingly, this suffix expresses many similarities to other Finnic cases that express a similar action or idea, like in the Finnish adhesive case. Some grammatical meanings in Chuvash are formed by combining two different suffixes. For example, the way to express the word since in Chuvash, as in since yesterday, is used by using both the ablative and instrumental case. So since yesterday in Chuvash would be tenpe, which translated literally is saying with from yesterday, but carries the meaning of since yesterday, of course. Comparisons in Chuvash are made by using the ablative case with a particular word order. For example, if you wanted to say larger than a house, you would say kiltan pisak. Translated literally, this would be from a house big. The way of expressing more in Chuvash is much different from Turkish. The only other Turkic language that I have a good knowledge of is Turkish, of course, and the word for that in Turkish is daha, and is used in many instances, just like the word is used in English, more. For example, daha uzun is longer in Turkish. However, in Chuvash, the suffix rah or rech is used. Now let's take a look at how possession works in Chuvash, but before that we need to learn about what the pronouns are of this language. Here is a slide with all of the basic pronouns in Chuvash that you can go ahead and take a look at if you would like and learn about them. Each of these pronouns has a separate form that is used when forming them into possessive forms. As you can see, these forms look much similar to the forms in other Turkic languages like Turkish and Uzbek, for example, seen here. One simple way of expressing possession is simply by taking the genitive case of these alternate forms of pronouns and placing it in front of a noun. For example, manın sara, meaning my beer, and sanın asate, meaning your grandfather. However, there are more than just one way to express possession. Another way is by conjugating the noun to agree with the genitive form of the pronoun, as in manan atem, meaning my father, which is a more formal way of showing expression of a noun. But if you do it this way, since Chuvash is a pro-drop language, you can drop the first word and simply say atem, also meaning my father. Verbs. The present tense in Chuvash both encompasses present in the sense of happening now and habitual acts. For example, in English we have I read, meaning I read as a habit, and we have I am reading, as in I am reading in this present moment. Chuvash doesn't distinguish between the two, and listeners will know the difference based on context. The present tense of the forms of the verbs to read are as follows in this chart I've made down here. On face value, these present tense forms seem nothing like that of other Turkic languages, like in Turkish, which I'm going to put on screen for you here. And that honestly is a really correct assessment, but I can almost see the similarities in the first person and first person plural forms with the or sounds you kind of hear, like vulatur and okior, both kind of have an or feeling to it, but who knows if that's really related or not. Just my own guess. The past tense in Chuvash is expressed similarly to how the locative case works with noun. For verbs that end in a consonant except L, N, and R, the suffix r is used. For verbs that end in an l, n, or r, the t suffix is used. And for verbs that end in the third person or that end in an l, n, or r, use the ch suffix. All of these verb endings are followed by the personal endings to show who is doing the action. For example, here are charts with all of the different conjugations for this form with the words to read, to write, and to come. However, this past tense form translates more so as the perfect tense. The other way of expressing the past tense in Chuvash more so brings the translation of was. This suffix is the equivalent of the Turkish suffix de, for example, Vesetche means flu. The future tense seems to be very simple in Chuvash. All you do is add the personal endings to the verb stem, plus any buffer vowels if needed. For example, sirap, I will write, and vulapar, we will read. Here is a full future tense conjugation chart for you to check out since I gave you one for the other forms as well. The only exception is the third singular and plural forms, which use an e or s suffix. To make a suffix or verb phrase negative in Chuvash, the ma or me suffix is added, and in the present tense, the suffix is mas or mes, as in sur mastar, I am not writing. The infinitive form in Chuvash is quite similar to the previously mentioned suffixes, all you do is add the ma, me suffix to the end of verb stems. For example, kilma, meaning to come, and taima, meaning to weigh. This also carries the meaning of ing in English, as in coming or weighing. Chuvash syntax is very similar to other Turkic languages, with its default word order being sov, and I personally like to think of this as Yoda talk. Adjectives go before the noun, like in English, and so do de demonstratives and the indefinite article. 
Here are some examples of sentences so we can see how the Chuvash word order functions. To wrap this video up, we're going to take a look at some comparisons between Chuvash and Turkish. One of my favorite parts about studying linguistics is how languages will develop and branch off into different directions and end up sounding totally different from each other. Like in the case of Indo-European languages, where the language I'm speaking now, English, originally comes from the same language as Persian does, for example, or Russian does, which sounds completely different and nothing like English. Chuvash is the most distinct and different Turkic language out of all of them. Most people who speak a Turkic language speak from the common Turkic language branch of the Turkic language family. Chuvash makes up the only living language of the other branch, explaining a lot of differences between Chuvash and other Turkic languages. This combined with heavy, heavy influences from Finnic languages, so much so to the point that this language was thought to be a Finnic language, also explains the distinct sound and uniqueness of this language among the other Turkic language families. The only other confirmed member of Chuvash's Turkic language family is the Bulgar language spoken by the Bulgar elites of Bulgaria. Other languages that are thought to have possibly been in this branch include Khazar, Hunnic, and Avar, which are all extinct languages. Let's take a look at some of the different sound changes that make Chuvash very different from the Turkic language I know best, Turkish. The L sound in Chuvash correlates with the SH sound in Turkish, like in the examples Khel and Kish, meaning winter, and utmal and altmish, meaning 60. The really unique s sound corresponds to the y sound in Turkish, like in sjaltar and yildiz, meaning star, sier and yuz, meaning 100, and sir and yaz, meaning right or to right. The z sound shifted to an r sound in Chuvash, like in the examples per and buz, meaning ice, khur and kaz, meaning goose, and tahar and dokuz meaning nine. The h sound correlates with the Turkish k sound as in hura and kara meaning black and again in hel and kish meaning winter. Many of the b sounds in Turkish relate to the p sound in Chuvash like again with per and buz meaning ice, piren and bizim meaning hour, and pilek and besh meaning five. A lot of these changes make sense due to their similarities like with h and k but some of these seem very strange and like completely different sounds like with the s and y or with the r and z sound. It's really cool to learn about these sound changes because the different sounds in Turkish and Chuvash and the different words that are related seem almost nothing alike but when you learn about these sound changes the relation starts to jump at you more. I could go on and on about different aspects of grammar, phonology, or history of the Chuvash language and I actually had a really hard time wrapping up this video. This language is just so awesome i could really just drone on forever like a true language nerd man i need a life if you want to learn more about this beautiful language i highly recommend these two books this first one being the chuvash manual which helped me out a lot with finding different examples and learning about how the chuvash language works as well as this big massive academic work with massive info on any turkic language you could ever want uh, which is basically acts as a Turkic Bible and I'm gonna have it linked down below and put it right here on screen for you Both of these were a really big resource for me And if you're interested in learning more about Chuvash or other Turkic languages I highly recommend you check out these two books Let me know in the comments what you think about this really unique Turkic language and let me know what other Turkic languages You want to see me cover next. Thank you so much for watching this video. You guys have a great day